Good afternoon. Today is February the 17th. I'm Council President Cynthia Borrego. Today is the 27th meeting of the 24th Council, and I will call this meeting to order. Um, all of our councilors are present, uh, except I think Don uh, Harris and Ike Benton are running a little bit late. And uh, so they will be joining us soon. But we do have a quorum uh, without them. So I will begin with a moment of silence. And I would just like to offer that moment of silence for the people who have been affected by COVID and people across our country who are experiencing difficulty uh, during this time with the weather, but also more importantly to the people that we have lost to COVID. So just take a moment of silence. Thank you all for that. I would like to ask our council vice president to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance uh, this afternoon, Councilor Gibson. And I would also like to ask Councilor Basson to lead us in Spanish. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States the United of, America, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilor Gibson. Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. Puro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa una nación bajo Dios Indivisible con libertad y justicia para todos. Thank you, counselors. That was beautifully done by both of you. So I'm just going to read this into the record. As noted in a press release from our office on Friday, posted on our website and noted on our published council agenda, this meeting has special procedures given the governor's declaration of public health emergency and restrictions on gatherings. Therefore, this meeting is being held via Zoom video conference. Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view this meeting live through four different platforms, GOVTV on Comcast, Channel 16, the GOVTV website, YouTube, and the Zoom webinar. These live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. For those watching on the live stream, thank you for joining us this afternoon. The video recording of this and all past council meetings will also remain available for viewing at any time on the city council's website. Council staff is available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding the videos online. Please call 768-3100 for assistance during business hours, which are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The council is accepting live general public comment today, as well as any written comments. Written comments received by 1 p.m. today were distributed to all of the counselors in advance of today's meeting. So with that, we will go to our first order of uh, a business which uh, is proclamations and presentations. And this afternoon uh, we have a, Councilor Davis, would you like to tell us about our first presentation since it was by your request? Thank you, Madam President. I don't think this will take but just a minute, but I understand that Director Pierce may be here, our family community will be here with us. Just to give us an update on the rollout of the voucher program and the emergency housing program, as you might remember, uh, at the end of last year, uh, there was some money left over that had not been expended and the department brought back a plan to get that money out. Um, during the over the winter uh, to some new community providers and we had asked the department to give us an update and I understand they have a good one for us. And I believe we have uh, Miss Huval, Lisa Huval, and 
possibly Director Pierce with us. Yes, um, thank you, President Borrego, and thank you, Councillor Davis, for the introduction. And I've got Deputy Lisa Uval with me for this presentation, and we um, appreciate the invitation. So um, we're here to talk about a, a supportive housing update, and we want to give the big picture, and then we're going to dive into the details. I want to start with just emphasizing, and the on the I guess it's the right hand side where you see permanent housing. This infographic really highlights the core strategies to really impact homelessness. And so what we're zooming in on today, I guess literally we're zooming in on, is permanent housing and supportive housing and the importance of that. And we knew, know that this is one of the most effective strategies to impact positively homelessness. Next slide. All right, so here we go with our overview. Next slide. And thank you. So just as a recap, supportive housing vouchers, a big broad term, it really means you're taking a housing voucher, and we'll talk about exactly what that is, which really is rental assistance, combined with the support services or case management, that's what equals housing stability. I want to make clear that motel vouchers, which are an important tool in the tool belt of um, helping people, is not a housing voucher. It gets somebody off the street for a night or two, which is good to keep them out of the elements. But we're, we're not talking about motel vouchers. We're talking about the specific housing vouchers that help rental assistance for people to get into um, a place of their own. Next slide, please. So over the last four um, fiscal years, we really want to show that we've had an increase of dollars. We really thank City Council for your support in the budget over these last four years. And I think we can all stand together very proudly to say this is a 44% increase in supportive housing vouchers since fiscal year 18. And this represents both a mixture of HUD money as well as general fund money. We can go ahead with the next slide. Thank you. So if we look at these last couple fiscal years with that increase in funding in FY20, that equals 742 households. And we'll be talking about households here in a minute. And then with FY21, with that increase of funding from by a million dollars, we were able to get 950 households in FY21 to date. Next slide. So what does this really mean? So for here in our department, it means that we have contracted with 17 different local nonprofit organizations. It could be Heading Home, it could be Healthcare for the Homeless, CLN Kids, just to name some of the names you may be familiar with, to provide housing that comes with that support that's needed. So the nonprofit has their contract and they provide a voucher to a household and they you take that voucher to rent an apartment from a private landlord. The household themselves pays only 30% of their income toward that rent. And then the remaining dollars go toward the rent, um, the voucher pays the remainder of that rent. And what's really important is the case manager helps with all that paperwork, finding the apartment that's going to accept a voucher and the services to be successful. And also what's really important is we want this to be sustainable. So you might think with 30% of one's income, okay, they put that in there. What would stop us from getting a Taj Mahal just for the lack of a really big apartment? It really might not match that household's um, needs or they might not be able to sustain it. And so we're always looking at how can this be sustained and somebody can be successful, which is ultimately being able to be housed on their own, being employed, um, having, being successful in that location. Next slide, please. So what's really important to know about households, and I, I know this makes sense to all of the council members, is it varies by the number of family members. So we, we talked about the numbers of households, but that could be a person of one, that could be a family of seven. And so every household is unique and they pay that 
30% based on what their household income is. And the length of the stay um, and, and the needed length of stay in the supportive housing program. Because not everybody needs um, a full year. Not everybody needs two years. All those circumstances really vary. Next slide, please. So some of the barriers that we find toward housing could be the lack of identification and that paperwork that the case manager is working with that family, that household to find. Sometimes that can take a long time to get. Sometimes a past history of evictions can be a barrier. But we've got to find the right match to um, reassure that landlord that we will be, our, our case manager, managers will be supporting that person and that this housing voucher adds some stability and that they're a good tenant. Bad credit, criminal history, no current income and no recent rental history. That could also be problematic. When I say no current income, yes, we said that 30% um, people pay 30% of their income with the housing voucher. And that could be from a, a job. It could be from disability income. It could be from social security. It could be from all kinds of sources. But when a, a landlord, a businessman or woman is presented with somebody to rent in their apartment and they see that they don't, they aren't employed or they don't really have the stable income, but they've got this housing voucher, there, so there can be concerns about that. And before we move on to the, some of the real um, meaty details on our contract updates, uh, as Councillor Davis mentioned, I just want to bring this to life with a real recent story that we got this week. And this woman knew that we were um, going to be sharing it. She's very proud and very optimistic about her future. So Cami is an Albuquerque native and she's been working on transitioning to housing since right before Christmas of this year. She's a single mother of six and three of her children are still living with her. She began experiencing homelessness over the last 15 years off and on because she was in an abusive relationship um, with her then husband. That relationship ended three and a half years ago. At that point, she and her children, her three children, they moved from her mom's house to friend's house to sometimes sleeping in her car. So health issues with the youngest children meant the child was in and out of the hospital needing, um, needing support and it was hard for Cammie to keep a steady job. And so she ended up um, losing her job. Well, it was actually hard for her to keep her steady job or her home. She still had her job then. Then she contracted COVID in October of 2020. With that, she lost both her job and her car. So through um, an APS school counselor, she was able to get connected to the West Side and healthcare for the homeless. And ultimately they began working with her on her housing journey. She's been getting the support she needed, but wanted to know, wanted all of us to know it's not just a smooth path. So as she reflected on this journey, she's got the help from Healthcare for the Homeless to gather the documents and the paperwork. She had to get a new version of any of her identification that had been lost along the way from moving in and out of her different living situations. She, um, she knows that as she's been working with healthcare for the homeless, that um, looking for a place to use the housing vouchers, she's seeing that there are fewer options because of the current COVID eviction moratorium has limited some of those units. She does not have a rental history, so she can't share that and she doesn't have a job while she's looking for a place. But she is really optimistic for the help that she's getting. And from the start of when she began working with Healthcare for the Homeless right before Christmas, till um, we're anticipating that she will be in housing by about March. So it's spent about two to three months for a motivated person to get into this housing. And this is one of our family families that we are caring for in our wellness hotel structure. And I just thought her story really helps bring to life um, the, the challenges but the successes of getting somebody on this path. 
And so with that, I'm going to hand it to um, Deputy Uval to talk about our current updates on our contracts. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So we, we do want to give some updates on current contracts. And what we'll walk through here is an update on our the FY20 one-time appropriation, which we use for rapid rehousing. The FY21 one-time appropriation, which we also use for rapid rehousing. The FY21 reoccurring appropriation, uh, which we were excited to use for to set up new permanent supportive housing. And then we also wanted to update all of you on expenditures for all of our current contracts. So I'll walk through each of those at a time. So we were um, very excited in FY20 when City Council appropriated a additional $2 million in one-time housing voucher funding. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> and you can go ahead, I didn't realize there was animation in the slides. You can go ahead and just, um, yeah, thank you very much. So we, uh, we used the FY20 appropriation to establish a one-year rapid rehousing program, which means that each household assisted can receive up to 12 months of rental assistance in case management services. We entered into two contracts, one with HopeWorks and one with Barrett Foundation. These are three-year contracts. Uh, the HopeWorks one started December 2019 and the Barrett one started in January 2020. As of December 31st, 2020, so one year into the contract, HopeWorks has housed 54 out of an estimated 127 households and Barrett has housed 15 out of an estimated 45 households. So we are very pleased to report that both agencies are on track with these contracts to house the number of households that they have committed to serving. And you can go ahead to the next slide. We were also very excited in FY21 when we received another appropriation of $2 million in one-time funding for housing voucher funding. So you can go ahead to the next slide. And again, yeah, just go ahead and pull up all the bullets. I apologize for the animation. So we also decided because this was one-time funding to set this up as rapid rehousing, a one-year rapid rehousing program. Again, providing up to 12 months of rental assistance and case management uh, services to each household that was assisted. We have entered into eight contracts uh, since November, 2020. Two of these contracts are with experienced supportive housing providers that we have other contracts with to do supportive housing. Four are with uh, agencies that serve young people. We're very excited about these contracts because we have never contracted with these agencies in the past to do supportive housing. So this is a new partnership for us. And we've also contracted with two smaller um, organizations that serve vulnerable folks. Um, and by new, they're not necessarily new organizations, but they're new to us in terms of new partners uh, for supportive housing. And all of these have been set up as 18 month contracts. We um, had the privilege of presenting to city council in mid-November of last year on our plan for this uh, 2 million in one-time money. And I'm really pleased to report that within six weeks of that presentation, we had executed our first two contracts. And um, those were with our two experienced supportive housing providers. So it was very, we were able to get those contracts done very quickly. And then within 13 weeks of our presentation, we executed the remaining six contracts. Those did take a little longer because like I mentioned, those were um, new agencies or new partnerships. They have not done supportive housing with us before. So it just took a little time and technical assistance to support them as uh, to meet our contracting requirements. But all these contracts are executed and uh, all of these agencies can begin the process of housing folks. Go ahead to the next slide. And this is just a summary of the folks in our community who are going to benefit from these funds. We identified three target populations. About half the funds will be used to house people that are currently living in our wellness motels. This is older folks, people with medical vulnerabilities and families with children. Another chunk of the funding will be used to serve young people, transition age youth 17 to 24. And then uh, the final chunk of funding 
will be used to serve other vulnerable adults in our community. These are the two smaller organizations that we contracted with who we believe are reaching people in our community that are likely not connected to um, or really engaged with some of the other service providers in our community. And altogether, we estimate that these eight different providers will serve 140 households. And go ahead to the next slide. Also in this fiscal year, we received or council appropriated $1 million in reoccurring money for housing voucher funding. Go ahead to the next slide. And we made the decision to use this funding. You can go, you, um, go back, go ahead and go back one slide. Perfect. Uh, to set this funding up as permanent supportive housing. Permanent supportive housing is non-time limited rental assistance and case management services really targeted to people where or households where one of the household members has a significant disability that impedes their ability to maintain housing. And that can include mental health, substance abuse, a physical disability, developmental disability, and also a severe chronic illness. Because of the pandemic, and because we know the safest place for people to be right now is in their own homes, we de decided to enter into an emergency contract with HopeWorks rather than going out to RFP to provide permanent supportive housing to an estimated 65 households. That contract has, has been executed just recently, so uh, HopeWorks like we'll, um, we'll also be able to begin the process of housing folks through this contract. The way we set this contract up is that 60% of the referrals will come from our wellness motels and the other 40% will come through the, our community's coordinated entry system. And then go ahead to the next slide. All right, so, so just switching uh, gears here a little bit, stepping away from the new funding, I just wanna give an overall picture on how we're doing with expenditures for our supportive housing contracts. Beginning this fall, we established a new process for oversight and monitoring of supportive housing expenditures. We now assess each contract every month to determine whether the contract is on track with its spending. If a contract is not on track, we require the agency to submit a written plan to us on how they will get back on track. And then we meet with the agency to review the plan and reinforce that we, um, our expectation is that the contract will be fully expended. These have been very productive meetings. I think one thing we have learned from these meetings is that the, um, the probably the major thing driving the expenditure of funds with the, the um, sort of what, what sometimes makes it difficult to expend the funds is when there is a housing opening. So this um, reflects what Carol was saying earlier. So a household leaves, maybe it's a success. They leave because they got, um, you know, they're able to maintain housing on their own. There's an opening. So the agency brings in a new family or a new individual, but it takes that, that individual or family some time to find a new apartment, to find an apartment. So in the meantime, that's funds that's not being expended. So one of the um, most important things that agencies can do to increase expenditures is to reduce the amount of time that it takes for a family or an individual to find an apartment. And what we've, um, what's come out of these meetings is like agencies are identifying very concrete ways that they can do that. One example is one agency decided that participants who are looking for housing absolutely need a working phone and they're gonna do whatever it takes to make sure that participant has a working phone, including paying for their phone bill while they're looking for housing. They shared an example of a, a person they were working with in an emergency shelter who had been looking for housing for a while, but without a phone. They decided to pay her phone bill. And within two days of having a working phone, she found an apartment. So um, little things like that can make a big difference. Because we're doing this monthly assessment, we know at any point in time, which of our contracts are on track and which are not. So I can tell you that as of today, we have 12 contracts that are on track with their expenditures. We have nine that are behind. Um, we also have the nine that were just executed, so we can't really uh, measure them yet. By on track, I mean that the contract is within 5% of where we would expect it to be. 
So if it's a one-year contract that runs from July 1 to June 30th, and the, the, we have invoices up to December 31st, we would expect the contract to be 50% spent down. If it's only 45% spent down or less, then we would consider the contract to be behind and we would follow the process that I just described. I do wanna thank uh, City Council for appropriating additional funding in Family and Community Services budget for a new position to help oversee these contracts. Like Carol said earlier, we have seen a significant increase in supportive housing contracts and additional capacity and bandwidth to oversee those contracts is much needed. So uh, we are hiring a community outreach coordinator position. That position was posted and closed. We have our top candidates and we are in the process of scheduling interviews right now. So very much appreciate the support on that. And then go ahead to the next slide. So I think in summary, the impact of this new funding that we've received over the last two years, uh, we've seen a 44% or 44 increase in supportive housing appropriations since FY18. Between FY20 and FY21, we anticipate serving in 28% more households, as, as many as 950 households in FY21. And also thanks to the new funding in FY21, we have six new partner agencies providing supportive housing in our community. So this uh, concludes our presentation and Carol and I are happy to answer questions. Thank you, Director uh, Pierce and Ms. Duvall. Uh, before we move on to questions, I just wanna mention for the record, that Councillor Benton and Councillor Harris have both joined us during this presentation. So we will move on to questions. And the first hand that I saw up was uh, Councillor Davis, followed by Councillor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. I'll make this really quick. And, and thank you, uh, ladies, and for taking the time <clears throat> to give us that update. Uh, I appreciate the time you've also given to me and I know some other counselors uh, offline to get us an update. There were two things I wanted to follow up on very quickly. Uh, and first, let me say, um, in terms of moving a lot of money in the city very quickly for a problem, I want to applaud the Family and Community Services for addressing this as a serious issue and a big opportunity and bringing in some new providers to help us uh, address those issues. And so kudos to you all for that. And I appreciate it. Um, I know, and, for, and secondly, I want to say thank you and congrats. I think that new oversight position is an excellent one, somebody to help uh, contractors keep on task and to help us identify and resolve those issues quickly is, is an excellent uh, best practice that I can imagine other departments in the city and other cities could copy. Uh, what I saw, and I wanted to, to ask very quickly, you mentioned that on those three-year contracts, um, right now we have about 200 and something thousand allocated for vulnerable populations, some of those special populations that don't fit other categories. That seems to me like a very small number over three years, given the number of folks that we have to serve. Um, I know one of those organizations in particular is doing good work and could do more. So as we head into budget time, could you give us an idea of what our need is or what the gap is in terms of um, these types of housing really quickly. And if I can thank you, Councillor Davis, and thank you um, all councillors for listening to our presentation. Let me answer and then I'd like Deputy Uval to follow up. Um, yes, on the 217 to go to our vulnerable populations, um, what we are asking for this year in our budget is 3 million in housing vouchers. Um, you'll see that coming forward in the FY22 ask. I think that keeps us moving forward and increasing the number of vouchers. I, I also wanna be clear, our, our slide might've been slightly confusing in that all those folks are vulnerable folks um, and people, whether they're in the wellness hotel, we were just making the distinction because we've lined up strategies in the wellness. Those are definitely vulnerable people that we're serving in, in addition to not only medically fragile and families. I think as, as we, we carved out those other, um, some of those contractors that I know you're familiar with that are doing great work are, that are just meeting different people in our community in the parks and on the streets. So 
I think they're not the only ones meeting that vulnerable need. Many of those contractors are, but we're um, we're requesting with the blessing of um, city council, three million more for our housing vouchers in the next year, continuing always to look at, at vulnerable populations, working with a variety of contractors and building on the bandwidth that we've really expanded right now. But I'd love um, Deputy Uval to add to that as well. Thank you. I, I think the only thing I would add is, and I think this um, gets at a, another part of your question, Councillor Davis, is, you know, we, we did commission a study from the Urban Institute to determine the amount of affordable rental housing needed for low, very low income folks in our community. And that report, the Urban Institute estimates in that report that we need 2,200 units of permanent supportive housing and 800 units of rapid rehousing as a community to fully meet the need for these supportive housing models. Um, so that's, I think, the overall picture of the need that we are trying to uh, chip away at here with these appropriations each year. Thank you, Madam President. And Ms. Uval, if I could follow and then I'll just be quiet and let the next councilor go. But um, what would be the cost to provide just those like 800 rapid rehousing units? I realize there are different levels of service, but based on how many we're providing now and where we need, like what is the number that it would take to, to meet the need in the city? Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, I usually rep, like have a conservative estimate that it's about $15,000 per year per voucher. And that can vary. Single individuals can cost less because um, they're, you know, their cost of their apartment is less, a very large family could cost more. So 15,000 times 800 is um, $12 million. And I would say, I, I, but I also would caution or, or just say, I think that's an, an, that would be an annual cost. You know, if we, if it was a one-time appropriation of $12, $12 million, we could get 800 folks housed for that year. But we know there's always going to be folks coming into our homeless system who need rapid rehousing. So there'd have to be an ongoing commitment to making sure that resource is available as people need it. Thank you. And I know Councillor Benton can comment on this um, as well, but I think we, um, I, I just think as we move forward in this, um, that I do appreciate we're chipping away at this one, two and $3 million at a time, but it, it does highlight that the longer we push the, um, the longer we delay fully funding, meeting that need. And even with a full, with a $12 million check, we wouldn't do it overnight because we don't have the facilities for that. The longer we push that out, the more expensive it's becoming every year. That number's grown from 600 to 800 in the last few years since I've been here in council. So I just want to remind our counselors that as we go into budget that I think we ought to start looking at a permanent source of recurring funding in order to do this instead of uh, taking the opportunity of one uh, one time funding when we have uh, good uh, budget years. And thank you for this time, Madam President. I know uh, we have other counselors in line and, and that's the last thing I have to say tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Um, we are gonna move on to Councillor Bassan and then Councillor Benton. I just, uh, Councillor Bassan. Thank you, Madam President. And yes, Director and Deputy, thank you so much for that. It was very informative. Uh, a few questions. And can you send us over um, or tell us now even the six new partners? Um, but if, if not, you can send it over or whatever, because I am curious to make sure to kind of be involved and see where we can assist with that as well. Um, and then I have two other questions. I'll just ask them both and then let you, let you respond how you choose. Um, but what happens when you were talking about the no current income? what happens and what do we do to help people find that current income or get an income so that the, these permanent housing can, can start to happen? Because I, I mean, no one can blame a landlord, but yet how do we give a leg up if you know, it's that vicious catch 22 and I completely understand it. So what services are we offering to make sure that we can, um, you know, I don't know, no pun intended vouch for them or, or help out with all of that. Um, and then the last question, is um, how long for those, those, I believe you said it was six remaining that are kind of behind on the expenditures. Generally, what's the average to catch up? And I know that you had said, Deputy, that there's you know some flexibility on that because of time it takes to find apartments or, or places to be, but generally what's the average to get caught up when someone is behind on the expenditures? Okay. 
Madam President, Councilor Brisson, thank you for all the excellent questions. Director Pierce, are you are yeah, you okay yeah, if I good. tackle those? Okay, so I'm gonna try to list the agencies for you. <laughs> Don't forget one. So the new the new partners are uh, Vision Sankofa, uh, Tender Love Community Center, YDI, New Day Youth and Family Services, Casa Q, and Serenity Mesa. And then the two experienced partners that we contracted with for this rapid rehousing is Heading Home and Cuidando Los Niños. Um, in terms of increasing people's income, that is really a core function of the case management that comes with the supportive housing voucher. So one of the top priorities of the case manager is to work with each individual and family to obtain a source of income. For many folks, particularly in rapid rehousing, which is the time limited assistance, that is employment income. So it's all about helping folks get back to work or if they're working, developing a plan to increase their income. For people in supportive housing, sometimes it's employment, sometimes it's helping people just obtain the disability um, benefits that they're eligible for, like SSI or SSDI. But that is absolutely something the case manager is working on with the family or individual. It can be very challenging to do that while someone is still experiencing homelessness. So often, the you know, that's the housing first model. The, the, um, the first priority is helping someone get into housing so they're safe and stable. And then it's about helping them access the resources that they need to maintain that housing, including employment or other sources of income. And then I really appreciate your question about how long typically does it take for these agencies that are behind to catch up. And the truth is, I, I don't know, because this is really new for us, a new process improvement that we are tracking these expenditures each month requiring a plan, tracking the plan to see if it's working. So we are learning from this experience. I will say what I see is that some agencies are only a little behind, like one or two percentage points. And I think they're going to catch up very quickly. Others are more significantly behind and they have identified um, a change, they have identified changes that are going to work but it is going to take time for those changes to have an effect, if that makes if that makes sense. You know, it's like they're gonna like one a couple agencies decided we're going to make more regular contact with people with our participants while they're looking for housing. One agency actually decided we're gonna make contact every day until someone finds housing. So um, that is going to help them get folks into housing quicker, but it might be um, a couple months, like a couple rounds of participants before we see sort of the catch up on the expenditure side. So I hope that is um, answers your questions. It does. Madam President, one follow up, please. Thank Go ahead, you. Councilor. Thank you. Um, no, that did definitely answer my questions. Um, going back to the income part, when someone qualifies and like they're, we're ready to give them a voucher and we're ready to put them somewhere, but they don't have this income, do they lose, I guess, their place in line? Do, do we just wait? Do they stay at the shelter? What, what happens to these people um, when everything is trying to fall in line except for the fact that they may need some income in order for someone to provide some housing to them? Madam President, Councilor Brisson, thank you for that question. You know, the, the advantage of the housing voucher is that the household only pays 30% of their income towards the rent. So if in fact their income is zero dollars, then at the beginning they would pay, they would not pay anything towards the rent. So the fact that they don't have income doesn't mean they don't qualify for a rental voucher or a housing voucher. They will still qualify for a supportive housing voucher and the supportive housing voucher initially will cover the full cost of the rent. But again, the case manager will be working with that family or individual immediately to increase their income so they can contribute towards the rent. Where the barrier is what we hear from our community partners is when you have an individual or family 
out looking for an apartment in the private rental market, and it's a very tight market right now, especially with the moratorium, which we obviously we like the moratorium, but it, it means there's a very tight vacancy or very tight, you know, rental market, very little vacancy. And you, so if you have a landlord looking at multiple applicants, one applicant might have a housing voucher, but also has no income, that applicant might not seem like a very good candidate to rent to. So it just is part of, it's like one of the layers of challenges that um, families and individuals are facing when they're looking for an apartment. Thank you, Councillor. I hope that answers your question. If, uh, if so, then I guess we will move on to Councillor Benton. Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Um, question for Lisa and or Carol. Um, with regard to the uh, the nine organizations that are behind on their their schedule, and possibly this may end up applying to some of the new contracts, I appreciate the oversight position. I think that is really on target. Um, but are there also kind of institutional capacity questions or um, concerns about the pipeline of people who want to work in this line of work? Um, is that part of the capacity picture with any or all of our providers? Carol, do you wanna take that one or do you want me to answer it? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. <laughs> All right, Madam President and Councillor Benton. Um, I would I would say overall, no, I'm I don't have concerns about the capacity of the organizations that are that currently have these supportive housing contracts and are administering these funds. I I do think the with this new position the ability for us as a city to be able to offer ongoing technical assistance and support to these agencies is going to help. I think they're in a good place. This is just going to make them even stronger. Okay. I also believe that there is capacity in our community to uh, administer additional supportive housing vouchers. I think there's a lot of interest from different partners in our community to administer supportive housing vouchers. I will say the capacity and interest is much more limited when we're talking about one-time money. We have found that to be a challenge. It is difficult and challenging for organizations to implement and scale up a new program just to wind it down a year and a half, year to two years later. And it makes it challenging to recruit and, main, and uh, maintain talented staff when it's a contract that is going to expire at a step point. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And Madam, Madam President, if I may, a couple other yes. questions. Um, on, uh, and I'm sorry, my connection has been unstable. I've been getting off and on the, the call. Um, with regard to the uh, funding for heading home vouchers, is that, related to, I know Albuquerque Street Connect is also, is, is, has been in the business of trying to get people housed and getting them ready to accept, you know, some of the more, most chronically homeless, getting them ready to, to accept housing if we can find it for them. Um, that's, that's a challenge with many of that population. Is that heading home money available to them as well? I was just wondering about that. To, Adam, for anyone who's listening who doesn't know what Albuquerque is, it's a subset of Albuquerque heading home, but they're, they have a focused model of street outreach. I think they have three teams now basically working. They, they're very helpful to our police department in, in terms of dealing with the chronically homeless. But, but uh, my understanding is they're moving towards building that capacity. And how does that fit in the picture? Or is that on your radar screen? Or, not. Madam President, Councillor Benton, the current new contract that we have with Heading Home, the, the one-year rapid rehousing contract from the, with the FY21 money, is um, 
all the referrals for that rapid rehousing are coming from the wellness motels. We have not connected it to the Albuquerque Street Connect. I definitely think that's something we are interested in taking a look at in the future with additional funding. Because and I agree, again, um, those are folks that need that need housing. <laughs> no, no kidding. Uh, yeah, um, and, and it's not easy, you know, like many of the folks on the street that, that are the most chronically uh, uh, unhoused are, um, you know, they have a lot of issues with trusts in institutions and no matter who it is, whether it's the police or your department, you know, they, there's just a lack of, of trust. And so that is something we've got to build up. But then um, I, I just to, thanks for the, the answers. And I'll just say to, to those on this call that, that uh, Commissioner O'Malley and I who sit on the, the, uh, the board, the, uh, the council uh, for uh, the homeless coordinating council have been working with um, the county's lobbyists and, and, you know, after the session, hopefully have discussion with our lobbyists. This isn't really ripe for the session at this point, but, but of, of finding a brainstorming collectively between ourselves and the county and anybody else who wants to pitch in uh, of how to, how to create the, uh, the affordable funding stream and, and just, for those watching tonight, I mean, I, I'm de I'm deferring once again my two cent gas tax. We had talked about that just being for roads, you know. I, I'm completely open to anyone's ideas about um, that. That's a source of revenue. That is a source of recurring revenue to the city. We're bringing not a great amount of money between three and a half and four million a year, maybe. Uh, but um, it's something, and I think we've got to put everything on the table right now and have a community discussion about how we're going to tackle the housing problem in the city. And th that sounds like a weird fit. Maybe that's only allowed. I can't even remember now whether the state only allows us to spend that type of money on roadways. But if they don't, you know, um, we just need to be looking at everything like that. And uh, um, there's a good understanding that we've got to do that and a lot of uh, people wanting to pitch in on that on the homo homeless uh, coordinating council various groups and subcommittees thanks thank you councillor benton um there are no other councillors waiting in the uh room uh chat room um i do have a question myself though um and i realize lisa this is really about um the housing voucher program. But my question is with regard, and it kind of goes back to um, part of what Councillor Bassan was asking. Um, how do we track people in the long term? I mean, I think our ultimate goal is to get people off the street, get them into housing, um, you know, temporary housing, and then maybe more permanent housing. How do we track, um, you know, how many people have actually gone into eventually permanent housing and how long there, you know, if, do we track, is there a program that the city has that actually tracks that goal? Madam President, um, yes. So all of our HUD funded supportive housing programs are required to enter data into what's called the Homeless Management Information System or HMIS in the city also requires all of its general fund supportive housing programs to also enter data into HMIS. And HMIS collects demographic data about the people being served, but also the outcome data. So agencies regularly have to update information for each household they're serving um, regarding like their increases in income, but also when the household exits, they also have to um, they also have to enter into this database, like what was the housing destination or the exit destination when that household left. So each agency is required to report to us quarterly on the percentage of households who have, I mean, are, I mean it's, it's a little different. I don't want to get to the weeds right here on the different types of contracts, but basically is required to report to us quarterly on housing outcomes. So how many folks have maintained housing or if they've exited, how many have exited into permanent housing. And they also are required to report to us quarterly on the success that 
organ or individuals and households in the program families in the program are having increasing their income. And those are both scopes in our contracts as well. So the outcomes that we expect to see in our contracts is a certain level of housing stability and an increase in income among adult participants. And it is this HMIS database that providers use in order to track those outcomes. I hope yes. that answered your question. Yes, it does actually. And do we as the council, do we receive information regarding a summary of that re report at some point in time? Because I don't remember Madam, seeing. Madam President, I don't believe that we have historically submitted that to you, but of course we'd be happy to provide that information. Okay, and then one just one last question. Um, with regard to when people go into permanent housing, um, are there programs that teach people how to be homeowners? Madam President, um, I would say typically that is not a focus for the case management services, preparing people to be homeowners. Often folks come in in such crisis with so many challenges. Um, it's really the focus is more on helping folks secure a source of income, connect to the community resources and supports they need, and often learn how to be a good tenant. It's not to say that some folks don't eventually focus on home ownership as a goal and become homeowners, but that's generally not the focus of the services that are provided. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Gibson looks like she has a question, so let me turn to her. Thank you, Madam President. And I'm sorry to uh, uh, raise my hand so late in this discussion, but I'm sitting here watching the snow just collect uh, outside. Um, and, uh, and I've thought about this a lot since, particularly since our temperatures have gotten so, so very low uh, just in the past few days, week or so. Um, and, uh, you know, we've talked before about uh, the, the uh, what appears to be an increase of people who are living on s in sidewalks and tents and, and that type of thing. Um, and uh, I suspect that there are, you know, it's a, a sad thing, but I, I, I suspect that there are some deaths uh, that have occurred because of this, uh, this weather and, and compounded by the fact of, of, of uh, the pandemic. Um, so do we, I think the rock does collect that data or, or manner of death and you know, how many, how many people are lost due to um, uh, you know, the environment, climate, weather changes, things like that. Uh, so actually that's a question for you. Uh, director or uh, deputy director, either one of you. Um, thank you, Madam President and Councillor Gibson. A couple of things on that. Um, so it's healthcare for the homeless does really track and we try to honor and memorialize if there are, is there, if, if and when there is loss of life on the street. And they have memorialized that in a beautiful wall there right on their facility at, Health, at Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless. Typically pre-COVID days on December 21st, the shortest day or the first day of winter and the shortest day, there's often a walk um, through Wells Park that goes, and this is probably why you thought the rock, it often ends up at the rock just to celebrate um, lives, um, but also just honor people that have lost their life on the street. Um, I also, if I may, wanted to add, um, yes, our, we get very concerned when we have these kind of temperatures. Um, we did and, and will continue tonight to have overflow shelters available, emergency shelter. Um, we had two last night and over the course of the weekend, we sheltered about 83 additional people um, in the weather and had the mechanisms to get people um, connected to that shelter. That will continue tonight and tomorrow night as well. And we, this is where we um, are really in sync and lined up with all of our partners, including those outreach workers that are so key on the streets. And um, 
Uh, I think I answered your questions, but you might have had one more. Uh, well, let me just follow up with that. I, I did print out the uh, press release, I think, that went out earlier. And so, um, because I want, did want to reference it to, tonight or today during the meeting, uh, first of all, thank you for your, your efforts and, and for you know the whole department who I'm sure sounds like you work really, really hard and long hours and uh, over the weekend. So I you know, very, very much appreciate that, that, um, that you've done all of that. An additional 80 guests, that just, that kind of was a little mind blowing for me. Where did you put them? And that's really my last question. Thank you. Uh, Madam President Borrego and Councillor Gibson, we um, shifted some of the purposing of one of our existing hotels. If you remember, I don't expect you to remember all these details, but there are two COVID positive hotels, three wellness hotels. They are still in operation, but with the decline of COVID, we've had less positive cases. So we shifted the purpose of one of those hotels to be um, overflow, emergency overflow. And we also, in partnership with one of our sister departments, DSA, opened up an overflow facility. And I always welcome on an individual basis to talk about where those are. It's just, we don't publicly say because then we, we will have people show up without the proper vetting or getting them to the right place. For example, um, at our one of our overflow facilities last night that I was there to support our team and just see the operation and it was just running very smoothly. Um, we had a couple of gentlemen um, show up and that was great. We wanted to make sure, but through the screening process, we really did make sure the gentleman with the 101 fever who was clearly not feeling well, that was not the place for him in this overflow shelter. But we did through our emergency operations center provide transport and get him to where there was medical care and get him to the, the more um, health hotel. So um, I appreciate you asking the question and I appreciate the acknowledgement. It, it is beyond our department. There's a lot of people that have rallied to make sure we've got that safety net, especially in, in times like these. So um, I appreciate the question. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Um, thank you, uh, Director uh, Pierce and uh, Ms. Duvall. I think you guys are doing an outstanding job and uh, I know it's a difficult task to deal with um, a growing population, but um, you know, I think on behalf of the council, we're, we're grateful for what you do. So thank you. Um, with that, I think we're gonna move on. We don't have any further presentations um, we don't have any proclamations tonight. So we will move on to general public comments. I'm gonna move the uh, agenda around just a bit. And I'm going to read into the record um, just some information for the public. We do have six individuals signed up to speak this evening and they're in our waiting room. Mr. Moya will move them out of the waiting room um, and I'm going to read this just so uh, the public understands how we handle public comments. Um, hello to those joining us to provide public comment this evening. As stated earlier, we also received written comments that were distribu distributed to counselors in advance of today's meeting. Members of the public will be able to address the council if they have signed up for live public comment per the rules published on the agenda and on our website Friday. Speakers will be moved into the meeting room two at a time. They will remain muted with their camera off until they are called upon to speak. And Mr. Moya will assist us with that. At which point they can turn on their camera, unmute themselves, and they will have one and a half minutes to provide comments to the council. After that, they will again be muted and return to be an attendee of the Zoom webinar. Here are the public comment ground rules. Each participant has one and a half minutes to present. Comments are to be addressed to the counselors only through the council president. Any disruptive conduct will result in removal from the Zoom webinar. There will be a one and a half minute time limit. The timer will start once you begin speaking 
and the Zoom moderator, Mr. Moya, will let you know when your time is up. Uh, Mr. Moya, would you please call the first, the name of the first speaker? Thank you, Madam President. Our first speaker is Peggy Norton, and she'll be followed by Linda Starr. Ms. Norton, I see you are have your video on and you are unmuted. Yeah, so your one and a half minutes will begin when you start. Good evening, Ms. Norton. Yes, hi. I can't believe I'm number one. <laughs> um, I just uh, I sent a uh, written comments last week about uh, permit parking uh, on two streets that was approved by your parking division near the nature center. And I'm concerned about it because it closes off access to the boss gate and the bike trail at Campbell Road for the general public. Um, and it limits access to, ca to Candelaria. And on a bigger vision of the North Valley, I'm concerned that between I-40 and Montano, the only real parking lot that is available 24 seven is at Gobbledon and I-40. And the consequences of this ends up shutting off the Bosque and the bike trail in this area of the North Valley to the general public. It's only open to people who live nearby and in the gated communities there, which are many. Um, and I, I guess what I'd like to have is a look at our permit uh, parking system and see if there's other issues that can be looked at before just having 51% uh, wanting it. One street, half of the street backs on to a nature preserve. So that's what they see in their backyards and they don't want to see people in cars in their front yards. So, and I know a lot of people are going down there. It's COVID, it's a very heavily used area, but somehow I hope we can look at solutions for this rather than cutting off access to the boss gate. Thank, Thank you, you for Ms. your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Starr. Linda, please feel free to turn your camera back on, uh, unmute yourself, and your one and a half minutes will begin when you start speaking. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Chairman and um, counselors. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm speaking today as a representative of the Rio Grande Valley Broadband of Great Old Broads for Wilderness. We have been supporting the pool property um, preservation and we have been out there, several of us have been out at different times to look at the pool property to see what's there and um, to also look at the Bosque. And we feel like this area needs to be preserved by the city, absolutely. And not developed with housing. There's housing all around the area. And I think that the city needs to allow corridors for wildlife, for the birds, for the coyotes, for the bees and the butterflies and everything in between. Um, we, we cannot develop the heck out of everything. We need to have areas that are preserved for wildlife and for people to be able to enjoy these areas. And there are lots of things that can be done with the property. Uh, and it, it could be an exhibit uh, facility. It could be a facility for youth. Um, uh, as just a small part of it with the rest of it preserved for the wildlife with access to the Bosque. We were there about two weeks ago and saw the cranes uh, on the river and it was, it was just wonderful being there. We also saw a beaver dam in the drainage ditch and it was fun to walk with our dog uh, on a leash. And, and just enjoy being outdoors. And there were so many other people there. It wasn't crowded. It was just wonderful. It was a beautiful day. And I think that the public needs to be, get the education that they would get from uh, a city part, uh, area that is preserved and protected and not built up with housing. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam. Mr. Moya. Our next speaker is Christopher Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez, uh, feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your one and a half minutes will begin when you start speaking. Mr. Ramirez, are you there? If, uh, can we move him to the end? In case he's not there. Madam President, uh, he is actually the last one that signed up that- uh, Oh, there, has oh, there he is, there he is. Mr. Ramirez, please proceed with your public comments. Your one and a half minutes will begin when you start speaking. Thank you so much, uh, City Councilor President Borrego and City Councilors. My name is Christopher Ramirez. I am the Executive Director of Together for Brothers. I'm also Chair of the City of Albuquerque's Transit Advisory Board. I'm speaking on three issues that I want to um, thank the Board for allowing public comment tonight first, of course. The first issue I want to uh, thank the, the City Council on is approving our new and returning members of the Transit Advisory Board. This monthly um, board is a really important part of the work that that I'm doing in the community to really ensure transit equity at all levels in the city of Albuquerque. So we are excited to have two new board, two new members, and I believe four returning members um, on the tab. Thank you for, for that, that important work of, of uh, proving those board members. The other thing I wanna do is just lift up Transit Equity Day last week and thank the city for its work to make transit more equitable in the city. Um, we're excited to have students younger than 25, seniors 60 and older and veterans have free fares in addition to young people 18 and um, younger. And we're looking forward to working with the city council as well on transit equity. And that leads me to my last um, uh, statement I wanna make in support of two of the equity bills. One, Councilor Sena's bill around infrastructure and making sure that we're looking at equity across our city, that there's been neighborhoods that have been historically disinvested in and part of that's connected to transit equity. Um, but I hope that you'll support that, that work to make sure that infrastructure and capital improvement is done in an equitable way. And then uh, Councilor President or Pr President Borrego, your bill around health equity, I just want to lift up and make sure that transportation and transit is included because during COVID, we're seeing how essential workers and people who need access to health care who are transit dependent are dependent on ABQ ride. And it's been incredible to watch the city continue to have bus service during COVID. I just want to lift up in Las Cruces, one way to make our transit more healthy would be to do free transit for everybody and do backdoor entry. It would make our drivers more healthy and safe less likely to transmit COVID or be transmitted COVID. And our riders would also benefit with health equity and economic equity um, during COVID. Thank you so Thank much you. for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Thank Ramirez. You, sir. Sir. Thank you for that comment. Madam sir. President, we had three other people sign up to speak, but they uh, have not joined the meeting. So that will conclude our public comment. Okay, it appears that the three additional people are uh, not um, in the Zoom room. So I guess um, if they come on a little bit later, we may go back uh, to listen to them. If not, we will move on to our next order of business, which is economic development discussion. And there is none this evening. And our next order of business is administration question and answer period. I did not receive any questions from uh, any of the counselors, but I would also like to give them that opportunity right now if they would like to um, ask any questions of the administration, this would be the time. Um, I don't see any hands in the Zoom room. Um, so I guess not. So we will move on then, counselors. Um, we will move on to our journal. And this would be Councillor Gibbs, Gibson, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. I move approval of the February 1st journal. There's a motion and there's a second from Councillor Jones. Are there any questions? If not, then um, Crystal, would you like to take the roll? Yes, ma'am. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? 
Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. Nine zero. Is that nine zero? Okay, that motion passes on a nine zero vote. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. So we will move on to communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Uh, Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing M9 and referring to Public Safety Committee. M9 is supporting the passage of proposed state legislation, House Bill 156, an act relating to crime prescribing a penalty for criminal sexual penetration by a peace officer on a suspect victim, witness, or detained person. Okay, Councillor Senna, um, I will offer a second on the House offering a second. So we need two thirds of uh, councillors present to uh, our work on the support issue. So, uh, Crystal? Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. Nine zero. So that, that passes on a 9-0 vote. Uh, we will move on to our next order of business. Uh, would one of you like to take that? Sure, Madam President. Uh, let me, I would move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing O50 and referring it to the Committee of the Whole. O50 is amending Chapter 2, Article 11 of the Revised Ordinances, uh, aka the City Budget Ordinance, relating to the preparation and adoption of the annual operating budget of our city. It looks like I have a second by Councillor Benton. Councillor Benton, did you want to offer anything regarding that since you're a co-sponsor? Uh, no, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, Madam President, uh, yeah, I think uh, this is timely and I hope we have the support of the council to, uh, to get this on the agenda. Thank you, or get this introduction in place. Thank you. Okay, it appears that Councillor Pena has a question. Councillor Pena? Councillor Pena, you're muted. Um, yes, thank you, Madam President. I just actually had a question for the sponsors just related to, is this for this budget cycle or is it for the next budget cycle? Is there an urgency? And I haven't really seen the changes. I asked for them right before the meeting, so I received a copy, but there wasn't a, a um, marked up copy. So it's kind of hard to see where the changes were made or what the intent of this legislation is. So um, I guess that's two, two questions. And then the final question is, is that um, wouldn't it seem more appropriate not to um, convolute this budget cycle if it's not for the next budget cycle and just send it to FGO. Madam President, if I may respond, the, the short answer is no, this would apply to future budget cycles. Um, but again, this is not for uh, immediate action. It's just referring it to the Committee of the Whole. And of course, the Committee of the Whole um, can decide when to take it up. But we think it's most appropriate that the council have it available while we're going through the budget process this year so that we can look at how we might update the budget process. And this gives us a framework. We would anticipate that the council would want to take this up at the end of the committee of the whole process. But as we know, uh, as soon as this budget's done, uh, we all start working on the next one. And so uh, we think it's important to have this sort of in the back of our minds as we go forward. Um, the, there are some there are not major changes here. The administration has been a part of the process. It just clarifies how our city's five-year goals are developed in concert with the administration um, and makes a distinction between personnel and operating funds uh, within each department um, so that those aren't commingled uh, or changed without authorization of the council is, are the major sections. But again, we think that's just important to have and we can do that while we're meeting as the committee of the whole at some point. Um, Madam President, and then just one Madam President, mm -hmm. I think I'm I'm going through the same thing Councillor Benton is with my it's buffering in and out, so I apologize. Um, so then my my next question is 
um, actually, so then it would seem as though it would it would go through FGO, but I can see I can see what you're saying about the the um, the it going through the cow, and then um, is there any way to get a copy or have it with the the changes made? Because um, like I said, I received the or old ordinance, and then I also received the the new changes, which I know it's kind of difficult because everything's kind of it was a very old document that's being refreshed. So if we can just have those, so it could be real clear to us counselors in terms of what those changes are, even though I apologize to Stephanie for having to make those <laughs> red line marks. Madam President, can I Any address counselor, I have a similar concern of receiving a copy because it seems like everything kind of flowed together and there were no plans or Red lines. So I definitely wanted, would like to see that as well. Um, Madam President, can I? Madam President, the end of your comment. Madam President, can I can I address the, that concern real quickly, please? Can I address that concern about the red line version real quickly, please? Oh, um, Yes, um, step, or it appears that our staff wants to address the red line question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam President and Counselor. I, I just wanted to comment on the process I used to um, prepare the amendment to the budget ordinance. Um, unfortunately, it became very difficult for me to create a red line version. Um, the budget ordinance as it sits currently has been added to over the years, like 30 years, and there is a lot of obsolete language in that document um, that doesn't coincide with the process that we currently use. Um, it would be very difficult for me to prepare a red line version uh, and make and it, that make any sense to you at all. I, I, I really got lost myself in the weeds. Um, I, I just wanna impart that the biggest change that was made from the process we currently use is that personnel and operating expenditures would be separated and subject to separate appropriations. So um, otherwise I will do my best to um, highlight the changes and the deletions that were made. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yada. Thank you, Ms. Yada for that. Um, I will move on. I think I had Councillor Basson, did you have a question? You had your hand up and then Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. That was my question and it has been fully addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Senna. Yeah, I think that was mostly my concern as well, Madam President. I'm glad that um, Ms. Yetta kind of clarified. I did get, I requested the ordinance, but I only got it maybe 10 minutes before council to go through it and it was a bit difficult to read. So um, thank you just for clarifying that. Um, that was my question. Thank you. All right, so uh, with that- Madam I President, I, I'm sorry. Uh, we have one more, Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. I'm just thinking that because of this and the conversation, and I don't know, so don't, um, don't get the messenger on this one, but I'm wondering if we can maybe have a, if, if need be a briefing or something when it comes time. So that way maybe we can have a discussion in, in smaller groups for the council if there needs to be clarification. Councilor Brisson, are you suggesting that we don't vote on this tonight or we defer it or what are you suggesting? No, ma'am, I think we can vote on it. I'm just thinking that with everybody wanting a red line, but then with Ms. Yara saying that it would be difficult to show a red line without it being too confusing, um, I guess my intention is going to be to probably reach out to council staff with some questions as we get closer. And maybe mm -hmm. it would be good for us to group together so that we can spare staff some of the time it might take to do it individually for all nine of us. We can do that. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Rail, are you there? President and uh, members of the council, we too have the same concern that many of you are expressing. We have not seen the uh, the bill itself. And I know what Stephanie's talking about, Ms. Yara, as it relates to the ordinance as it currently sits. So um, 
So if we are in, equally as interested as many of you are in what the actual, uh, how it all fits into the ordinance and, and what exactly does that mean during the budget process. So um, we thank the, some of the councilors for asking the questions that we're asking because we've not seen that uh, final version either. Thank you. With that, with those comments, what is the pleasure of the um, sponsors? Councilor Davis. Madam President, yeah, thanks. I, Madam President, again, uh, this is uh, like any other late introduction bill. It's just an introduction that everybody will have a chance to look at. The Committee of the Whole doesn't need any time soon. So we'll have plenty of time for, for those things to happen. This is just the procedural thing. It, rem it reminds me of the one we did at the last meeting about the pool property where we didn't have the final version in front of the council before, but we uh, we introduced it and allowed it to move forward so the councilors could get that information. So we do need to file it before we can do it. But I agree with Councilor Bassan. We should have those those briefings either as a part of the cow or individually if counselors need them and i know the administration has been participating with miss yara and our budget office about drafting the some of this language and so uh, i think everybody can catch up as soon as we have it filed but we have to file it first before we can do that okay and this is simply an introduction so uh with that i don't see any other questions from any counselors so we will move on to the vote um miss ortega Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. 9 0. Okay, Councilors, that passes on a 9 0 vote. I will move on to Councilor Gibson, and I need a motion for the letter of introduction. Councilor Gibson. I move approval of the letter of introduction. And there is a second offered by Councilor Jones. Uh, Ms. Ortega. Councilor Passan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. yes. Nine zero. Okay. okay, that motion passes on a nine zero vote. So with that, we will move on to reports of committees. Uh, Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, February 8th and reports out the following items. In the matter of EC 253, that it be approved. In the matter of EC 236, E C-238, EC-254, and EC-255, that receipt be noted. In the matter of R-129, that it do pass. In the matter of R-127 and R-134, that they be without recommendation. I, I make a motion to accept the committee reports. I see a second being offered by Councillor Senna. Um, so, Ms. Ortega, would you like to take that vote? Yes, ma'am. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. 9 0. So that report passes on a 9 0 vote. We will move on to Councilor Senna, the Public Safety Committee. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Safety Committee met on Tuesday, February 9th and reports out the following item. In the matter of R-130-30, that it be without recommendation, I make a motion to accept the committee report. There's a motion and there is a second being offered by Councillor Benton. Uh, uh, Mr. Pega, would you like to take that vote? Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. 9 0. Okay, that uh, passes on a 9 0 vote to accept that committee report. I will move on to Councilor Jones. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, February 10th, and reports out the following item in the matter of R 134 that it be without recommendation as amended. I make a motion to accept the committee report. 
second. There is a second being offered by Councillor Senna. And um, we will move on to Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. 9 0. Yes. It looks like that motion passes on a 9 0 vote. And that is a motion to accept the land use uh, planning zoning committee report. Um, we will move on now, councillors, to deferrals and withdrawals. Councillors, are there any withdrawal, any withdrawals or deferrals at this time? Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. In the matter of 018, imposing a municipal gasoline tax of two cents per gallon, conditional on voter approval, I move deferral until April 19th. Councillor Benton, you have received a second by Councillor Jones. Um, if there's no further discussion, then we will move on to our vote. Uh, Ms. Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero. Thank you, councillors. We're moving right along here. Um, that motion is deferred until April 19th with a 9 0 vote. Uh, the next item is uh, an item that I have that I am asking for a deferral on R130 establishing a city healthy communities public health and sustainability pa policy committee. And I would move deferral until March 1st. Second. It appears that I have a second by Councillor Bassan. And I will move on to, uh, yes. yes. I will move on to, Council, uh, to Crystal Ortega for the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yeah. Nine zero on the deferral. Thank you, Ms. Ortega. That motion passes and that concludes our deferrals and withdrawals. We will move on to our consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? And I would just like for the, um, for the record, um, well, first of all, are there any changes to the consent agenda? Councilors? It appears not. For the record, I'm going to just read this into the record for the individuals on tonight's consent agenda who are being appointed to serve on the board or commissions um, who are volunteers, by the way, and we appreciate you, and who may be watching from home. Thank you for your will willingness to serve. Uh, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. I'll move approval of the uh, consent agenda. Okay, we have a motion from Councillor Gibson and a second by Councillor Bassan. Uh, I need a vote on this. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. Nine zero. Thank you, Ms. Ortega. That uh, passes on a 9-0 vote. So we will move on to announcements. Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. There will be a public safety committee meeting on Tuesday, February 23rd at 3 p.m. Thank you, Councillor Senna. Um, I will move on to Councillor Pena regarding Intergovernmental Legislative Relations Committee. Thank you, Madam President. There will be an Intergovernmental Legislative Legislative Relations Committee on Friday, February 19th and Friday, February the 26th at 4 p.m. via Zoom. And if you don't mind, I'll just go into the next one. There will also be a Committee of the Whole meeting on Thursday, February 25th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Pena. 
Um, so t this evening, uh, just for the public uh, on our agenda, we do not have any public hearings scheduled this evening. Uh, we do not have any approvals um, on the agenda this evening. So we will move on to item number 14, which is our final actions. Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. R18 is a nuisance substandard dwelling or structure in need of abatement at 5609 Everett Road, Northwest 87120. I'm going to move to uh, withdraw this, but I would love to hear an update from Mr. Williams uh, on this property as to why we're withdrawing. Good evening. Good evening. Madam President, uh, Councillors, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brennan Williams. I'm the uh, Director of the Planning Department. Uh, code Enforcement uh, has been working with a new property owner on, on this particular site. Uh, if you'll remember uh, from a couple months ago, we were uh, waiting for that uh, sale, that transaction to take place. That has occurred. And I'm happy to report that the new owner has uh, not only worked closely with Code Enforcement, but has obtained the necessary uh, permits and the inspections to uh, get, the, get the house back up to speed. Uh, it's estimated that they're about 80% complete with that and code enforcement reports that within the next couple of weeks, uh, all of the previous violations will have been corrected uh, and the house will be able to be occupied again. Uh, because of that, uh, we are uh, recommending, that, as Councillor Senna pointed out, that this matter be withdrawn uh, so that the owner could complete that work and, uh, and we can get this off uh, the council's agenda. We'll certainly stand for any questions. Any questions of Mr. Williams? Uh, Councillor Senna? Uh, thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to note that this is the exact outcome that we always hope for in these issues is that um, the city intervenes in an issue like this and we really save um, houses from being demolished and properties to really increase um, the health and public safety of our communities, but also to really see that a house um, that has really great bones be saved. Um, so I just want to extend my um, gratitude to the planning department, Mr. Williams, and all of those that have been working on this property for so long, and really to um, the neighborhoods as well, and um, thanking them for their patience on this issue, as I know it's been a while that we've been discussing this property. So I'm really thankful that we actually intervened on this. So thank you. Any other comments from councilors? Okay, so Councillor Senna, you have a motion to withdraw? Is there a second? Do I need a second? Brett, thank you. So I guess we'll move on to uh, Mr. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on the withdrawal. Thank you. That motion passes on a nine zero vote. And I would also just mention that. Um, Councillor Sanchez is actually the one who started that. And after his passing, um, I kind of took it over and sponsored it. And uh, thank you for that, Councillor Senna, for being patient and working with those individ individuals. We appreciate that. Um, so we will move on to um, item number C, which is Count yeah. Councillor Pena and Councillor Senna, mm -hmm. floor substitute R85. And uh, I will turn it over to you, to one of you, Councillor Pena or Senna. Thank you, Madam President. So uh, floor sub R85 is supplementing priorities for the capital implementation program of the city of Albuquerque by implementing a community equity criterion to be used in the development of a plan. I, I move a due pass and uh, it looks like Councillor Jones has an amendment. Thank you. I need a, a second for that. Oh, okay. We do have a second from Councillor Senna. So um, that's the original floor substitute. 
and Councillor Jones, would you like to introduce your floor amendment? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam President. I move amendment to for substitute R85. It's in your iPads. And it is on page one, line 16, add an additional recital as follows. Evaluating geographic equity as a factor, together with all other relevant factors, will also help ensure that the city is fulfilling its responsibilities to the city as a whole. And then on page two, line 25, add a new section two as follows. Section two, the city shall implement a geographic equity criterion that evaluates the equitable distribution of capital resources throughout the entirety of the city for the 2021 and subsequent general bond programs. When considered together with all other criteria, this tool shall be used to promote equitable geographic distributions of capital funding throughout the city. Madam President, I move approval. That would be considered floor amendment number one. Um, do I have a second? I have a second from Councillor Bassan. Is there any discussion regarding this floor amendment? If not, then I guess, uh, Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, Councillor Jones, for uh, this amendment. I actually was going through it and I do support it. Um, I just want to touch base, however, with um, our Office of Equity and Inclusion Director, Michelle Melendez. I know that she also prepared maps um, on our request from this last council meeting. Um, so I just wanted to ask her opinion on this. Overall, I'm in support of the amendment. Ms. Melendres, are you there? Yes, good afternoon. Good evening, councilors, uh, Madam Council of President. Um, I've just seen this, um, haven't given it a whole lot of review, but I, if I understand it correctly, it calls for the city to consider conditions, including the social vulnerability that are present in a geographic area where a project is being planned. And uh, in addition, that it asks the city to consider conditions, including the social vulnerability to determine where geographically a project is needed, should one be located. So that to me seems like what the tool is designed for, the map tool that I provided to really help you look at what the conditions are geographically in your districts, according to many, many different kinds of factors. If I may, Madam President, may I respond? Okay. Okay, um, we'll go to Councillor Jones, then we have Councillor Pena and Councillor Benton. I think I had Councillor Benton first and then Councillor uh, I just wanted to make sure you saw us. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I had a, a question, Actually, I believe. Councillor, I'm sorry, was I was gonna have Councillor Jones respond oh, first. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I beg your pardon. Thank you, Madam President. Um, excuse me, Councillor Benton. I just uh, want to make it very clear that this is one more tool to be looking at this type of thing. It does not carry any more weight than any of the others, nor do the others carry any more weight than this one. It is just one more tool that we need to look at as we divvy up the funds and do the things that we do. And I, I think it's an important one uh, because of the equity that is important in so many ways in our city. So uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Senna, for understanding that this is an important part of it, and, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Benton, and then Councillor Pena. Yeah, just quickly, uh, uh, I, I support the amendment. But um, with regard to, uh, I believe this may be a technical question or offering a friendly amendment to Councillor Jones. I think the bill presently uh, addresses the 23 uh, capital process. We're sort of almost, we're dead into the, the present capital project process. So uh, that would be a friendly amendment offered to uh, Councilor Jones's amendment. Councilor Jones, would you accept that amendment uh, to change the date from 2021 to 2023? Um, 
Madam Chair, I just want to, uh, Madam President and Councillor Benton, I want to make sure that that's really what we're talking about here because I couldn't find it um, written that it was 2023. So I just wanted to make sure that we are, if we're going to be considering any portion of this in 2021, we need to consider this part too. So maybe administration or Mr. Melendrez or someone could answer that question for me. I, I would ask the original sponsors. I believe at least the copy I have uh, refers to 2023 process. I see Mr. Melendrez, Madam President. Councillor Pena or Councillor Senna, would you like to respond to that? Um, yeah, it's for next year's budget. I mean, the next 2023 cycle, as Councillor Benton stated. So, you know, I think the okay. amendment, the friendly amendment would be appropriate. Then I guess, uh, Councillor Jones, you would accept that friendly amendment to your amendment? Madam President, if you don't mind, I would like to listen to uh, hear from Mr. Melendres first. Uh, since he is, Melendres, are you with us? Yes, Mr. Melendres, do you mind explaining where we are with this? So we are all on the same page. Yeah, thank you, Madam President and Councilors. Um, so you know, there's been a, a bit of a history with respect to this bill, and the first time around, um, with the original bill before the floor substitute, it was amended to reference the 2023 CIP um, based on the same rationale that Councilor Benton just articulated. Um, and so it probably would be appropriate at this point to amend this to the 2023 cycle as well, because I think that that was actually accepted um, by the sponsors at the time. And we've heard con uh, confirmation of that from Councilor Pena just now. However, I'm reviewing the floor substitute that's in your iPads, which is the bill that you're officially voting on. And it still does reference 2021. And so I think an amendment would be appropriate there as well, at least in the version that I'm looking at in the iPad. Actually, I may be incorrect. I may have been reviewing the original bill. Give me one second here. Madam Chair, I'd correct that. Yes, the floor substitute does correctly reference 2023 already. So that is accurate. And so this amendment would uh, be appropriate to be changed to reference 2023 as well. And if I may, Madam Thank President. Thank you, Mr. Melendrez. Councillor Jones, would you accept that amendment? I would indeed. Thank you. I just didn't want them to be conflicting. Thank you, Madam President. And thank, thank you. you. So we have a floor amendment number one with a friendly amendment to change the date. Uh, Councilor Pena. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to say that I support the, the amendment and the friendly amendment as well. I think it's really a matter of um, wordsmithing and I, I think it actually achieves exactly what we're trying to do um, originally. So thank you, Councilor Jones. Thank you. Um, is there any more discussion regarding this um, amendment and the friendly amendment? I don't see any hands up in the chat room. So I will move on to the vote for, for amendment number one. one. Ms. Crystal, uh, uh, Crystal Ortega. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on amendment one. Madam President. Yes, yes. Councilor Pena. Um, I don't think myself or Councilor Senna were asked to close on the bill, so I just just wanted just to you say that you vote on the bill? to close on the bill. Oh, to close on the bill. I'm sorry. I have another amendment, so uh, we're not ready to close yet. Oh. Thank you. So um, uh, floor amendment number one passes on a 9-0 vote. Councilors, I have a pocket amendment and I think um, I would like to put it up on the screen. It's something actually pretty simple, I think, um, but I'd like to present it to you. Uh, Mr. Moya, can you get that up on the screen for us? Thank you. Um, what, I'm at, what I'm adding to this bill, and this would be considered floor amendment number two if the sponsors accept it, on page two, line 20, after people of color insert, insert and higher levels of poverty. And basically what this change does, um, it changes section one to read as follows. The city shall implement equity criteria that evaluates historic disinvestment in the areas, in the sub areas of the city with higher populations 
of people of color and higher levels of poverty to be included as part of the city's overall criteria and it continues on um, as written. The purpose of the amendment is to include poverty as an additional consideration of, to race in the creation of the equity guidelines. And I would offer that um, motion to include poverty. It looks like I have a second from Councillor Benton. Are there any questions? Thank you for that second, uh, Councillors. It looks like I have some questions. Councillor Senna, Councillor Basson, and Councillor Jones. Yeah, I did not get to see this language early on, and I'm just wondering, you know, if the language that we already have and kind of the criteria that this process goes through doesn't already address some of that. I just want to make sure. Um, can I get some clarity on that? Because I believe it is one of our Maybe criteria. Maybe we can go to yeah. Mr. Lynn. Councilor? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Madam President. What did you say? Uh, I said possibly we could go to Ms. Melendres. I think all it does is clarify that we are including um, poverty as well as um, the other criteria that was established. Ms. Melendres. I'm sorry, are you saying Melendres or? Yes, Melendres. Okay. I'm sorry, Melendez. Okay. Well, um, I can't answer that question. I mean, you, you use the word underserved, which implies that poverty is implied uh, by underserved. And um, I think in your original floor sub, you, you say that it should prioritize race and income. So that would take into consideration poverty. I think it's already in the floor sub is what I'm saying. Um, actually, I don't think poverty is, and that's why I included it. Because I, th I believe that they go hand in hand. Madam President, pardon my interruption. May we please see the screen one more time? Yes, absolutely. Mr. Moya, could you show the... Yes. Actually, the way that I saw this is that it would strengthen the bill to include both um, race and poverty. Councillor Jones and then Councillor Davis. Thank you, Councillor Madam Jones. President. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I can't support this because I find it more confusing than if we were to leave it as it is, which is already addressing uh, the issue that you've brought forward. Uh, and and I, think, uh, I think the last thing we wanna do is make this legislation um, confusing to read and to enforce. So. Um, I think that this intent is already in the legislation um, and maybe the sponsors would like to tell me if that's not true. But I, I, I think we sometimes in trying to clarify things, we might muddy them a little bit. So I don't support this legislation. Thank you, Councilor Jones. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. I I just want to point out, I, I realize we're getting hyper technical on something that's sort of a guideline for us to use in the future, but um, I, I see this, the Madam President's intent here, and I think by stating higher levels of poverty implies to me that in addition to looking at issues like income, 
um, that there might be a sliding scale of consideration for communities that have disproportionate levels of poverty relative to the rest of the city. So I, I think that's what I read out of it. And I think that's the sponsor's intent, if I understand. So I could see a reason to support this in addition to already having the income piece. No harm in saying it twice. Uh, we won't count it twice, but I think it gives more guidance to the future policymakers who might read this without uh, the benefit of this prolonged conversation today. Thank you, Councillor Davis. I'm not trying to muddy the waters. I'm actually just trying to clarify that race and poverty go hand in hand. Unfortunately. So I have a motion and a second. Uh, any other comments? If not, uh, we will move on to a vote on floor, floor amendment. amendment two. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. No. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. No. Councilor Jones. No. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Motion passes on a six to three vote. So that is on a six to three vote. Thank you, councilors. And uh, we move, move on to the original bill, floor substitute. And uh, unless there are other questions, Councilor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Just, just quickly, I wanted to appreciate the sponsors for bringing this forward I, and, and uh, uh, Councilor Jones and Borrego, uh, President Borrego, for offering the amendments. I, this is a, this is a, important to clarify this criterion. Um, it, to me, it raises questions about our CIP process in general and making it that that whole process of how it's developed a little bit more clear to the general public as well. And uh, I'm sure there are a lot of data points. Uh, had this conversation recently that that um, I don't know that there's anywhere in the CIP ordinance that talks about just some of the metrics, other metrics that that, that we could be talking about, you know, things like, and I'll just pick an example from my district, the sheer length of uh, roadway with substandard <laughs> infrastructure. And I'm sure I'm not the only one with that, but, but the older parts of the city certainly have the, these examples where there's just a bigger backlog of things to be improved. And uh, I'm not suggesting this is an amendment to this, but I, to this bill, but I really think we, we need to continue with discussions um, about the transparency and the, and the methodology by which uh, projects are, are uh, considered. I know that the DMD does that with regard to roadways. They keep, a, they keep track of how old and, and the condition of each roadway but um, I, I guess I'm coming from this, uh, coming at this more from the standpoint of the sponsor of the Complete Streets Ordinance and the, the policy that we have in place with regard to walkability and um, the attractiveness of, of our streets uh, to, to have people be there and enjoy a sense of place. And so there, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of aging infrastructure of all types that have to be considered. And, uh, without getting way down in the weeds or micromanaging what DMD does with, with prioritization, I think it, it merits continued discussion by the council. So thank you. Thanks to the sponsors and sponsors of the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Any other comments from any of the other councillors? Um, I want to take the opportunity to, uh, well, Councillor Senna, go ahead. Uh, Madam President, I just wanted to make sure that Councillor Pena and I have an opportunity to have closing remarks. Absolutely. Um, before you close, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for these uh, for this particular bill. I think it caused all of us to um, really sit and think about how we do business in uh, from a CIP standpoint, and you know we we actually looked back into the past and how we used to do it. 
uh, when we did sector plans and uh, when we had um, the designations of pocket of poverty and other issues. And as our city ages, um, and we are, I mean, you know, just like all the rest of us, unfortunately, um, you know, I see areas around town as I drive around thinking, boy, that area used to be an area that was a newer area of town and now it's an older area of town. And, you know, you see uh, things of areas of disinvestment that occur, um, you know, and the needs just keep growing as we, as we uh, move forward. And, you know, I, I had a conversation the other day with Councillor Gibson about some of the areas in her part of town that could actually be redevelopment areas. And we've had this conversation for a lot of uh, several years, Councillor Gibson. Um, but you start thinking that there are areas around town that actually, you know, you know, need more investment. Um, and as the city grows further and further out west or or north or where whatever direction it grows, uh, you start kind of realizing those things as you drive around town and you see things that are deteriorating. So I do appreciate our um, our counselors for bringing this forward because it really did cause us to look at. And as we move forward with our community identity identity areas, that's another process that will bring forth some new, um, you know, some areas that maybe we hadn't looked at in the past. So uh, with that, I'm going to offer our counselors to close on their on their floor substitute, and then we will take the vote. Councilor Senior or Councilor Pena. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'm just going to be brief, and I'm sure Councillor Pena will uh, wrap up as well. I just want to extend my same appreciation to all of uh, the council members uh, in our discussion on this resolution. And I do hope that even though this is not to, for um, till 2023, that we also think things through of how we make these investments as we go into the budget year, as Councillor Ben was saying, um, and really think of how the data and the maps that were presented to us um, and where we can make uh, continued improvements throughout the city, not just in our districts. And really thank you all for, for contributing um, to the language of the resolution. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Senna. Councillor Pena. Thank you, Madam President. Well, first of all, I just want to start by thanking Councillor Benton. He's actually the one that put this in the last budget cycle, you know, and I just thought it was important that we made this part of, um, you know, our our process our process moving forward, I just think it, it's important, um, kind of like some of the other counselors are saying, just having that conversation about, you know, our respective districts. Um, you know, I want to thank Councillor Jones for the language she added, you know, sometimes we, um, we get um, caught up in the weeds with the words. And I think um, your amendment really helped to clarify basically that it was really just intended for us to really look at, you know, just the city as a whole and have an opportunity to look within our own districts for, for needs that, that we have as we move forward. And then, um, um, and Councillor Borrego, you know, I, I was not hesitant. I think it was important to support the amendment that you had put forward. It kind of felt though, as though it was kind of what, what was argued initially as part of some of the language <laughs> and then it was we came full circle and then it's it's kind of added back in there you know so um i just you know i just really would was hoping that we could get the the support from all the counselors um just because it's it was important um uh to do so but uh again i just want to say that I think it's important moving forward, um, this legislation, and it'll make us a better city and it'll help us look through things with a different lens. So thank you all for your support. And with that, Councillor uh, Pena, um, I would just also like to thank the staff because we really had them on their toes on this one. And uh, uh, Ms. Melendez and um, you know the maps that she provided to us were very helpful. And also um, uh, Director Montoya and his staff, I think, uh, you know, as you mentioned, this will definitely help us move forward. 
Uh, so with that, I'm going to take the vote. Uh, I'm going to move to Ms. Ortega. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero. Congratulations, ladies. Thank you for your work on that. Uh, we will move on to item D, which is uh, Councilor Basson and Councilor Jones, floor substitute R123 regarding um, the Albuquerque police chief and the process. One of you like to present that? Councilor Jones, may I, or do you want to go? Please do, Councilor. Thank you. Uh, I would like to move floor sub R123, uh, directing that a policy or procedure be developed to address instances of unexpected departure, unavailability, or incapacity of the Albuquerque Police Chief, requiring recruitment updates for a permanent chief when a vacancy exists. Um, I want to move a due pass, and then we do have an amendment. Thank you, Councillor Basson, and I have a second from Councillor Jones. Are there questions regarding this? No questions regarding the floor sub. Uh, it appears that we have a floor amendment, and I will I will enter this floor amendment number one into the record. Um, and this is sponsored by Councillor Basson. Councillor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to move uh, floor amendment one for R2123. On page two, lines three through seven, strike section one. Um, and then we're gonna do the um, details of moving up section page two, uh, strike two and insert one, strike three and insert two. The explanation of this is upon further research and information gathering, we were able to find that APD does um, very happily have a standard of operating procedure 311. It's their command staff responsibilities in place. So there's no need to direct the police department to create a new policy. Thank you, Councilor Basson. I have a second by Councilor Jones. Um, are there any questions regarding floor amendment number one? It doesn't appear so. So we will move on to Ms. Ortega to take the vote on floor amendment number one. Councilor Basson. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero. Thank you, Ms. Ortega. That floor amendment does pass. So we will go back to uh, the floor substitute R123, are there any questions from any of the counselors regarding this? I don't see any hands up in the chat room. So um, I will move to uh, Ms. Ortega on floor substitute R123. Councilor Bassan. Uh, just real quick, Madam President, just to close, I just wanted to- I'm sorry, Councilor, yes. That's okay. okay. And I know it's, it'll be really brief. I just want to say thank you to the administration um, and city legal for working with us on this. Um, we've gone back and forth for a little while about uh, how best to make sure to have the communication for the public, as well as for the council and for such an important role of the police chief. So um, I think that we've come to a place where there's going to be, I realize that right now we're almost close to hearing about a selection for a police chief. So it's almost a moot point at this venture, but at the same time in the future, this could be very beneficial. So um, I know that I thank Councilor Jones for bearing with me on all this as well. And I urge your support. Thank you, Councilor Basson. Councilor Jones, did you have anything you'd like to say? Um, thank you, Madam President, only that it's this is an important thing to keep an important piece of legislation to make it clear to everyone in the public and in the city council uh, what happens and why and when and when. So thank you very much, Councilor Basson. Thank you, Councilor Jones. So we will move on now to uh, Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Basson. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. 
Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. 9-0. Thank you. That uh, passes on a 9-0 vote. And with that item, uh, unless there's any other business that the council would like to entertain, there is no further business and this council meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, counselors. Okay, that was a good meeting. Pass, thank you.